Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church on All Saints Sunday. This is the day on which we remember those we have loved and lost, especially this past year. Next Sunday is Consecration Sunday. That is the day on which we consecrate or set apart a portion of our income and dedicate it to a higher purpose beyond our own needs or desires or our own family and share it with the wider family of God. Some of the saints in my life are my grandparents who passed on to my parents and then to us the tradition of tithing, giving 10% away to others and to higher causes. Abigail and I will be giving $230 a week for 2024 to support the mission of St. Paul's. I invite you to reflect on your giving and to give generously in the year to come. Now let us join in worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who unfeignedly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. A reading from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, 
What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Richard Lisher has taught for many years at Duke Divinity School. In his book, Stations of the Heart, he tells of when he was a parish pastor and a prospective member asked him about his church. He immediately spoke of programs and building facilities and committees and small groups and youth ministry. But the prospective member made a startling comment. She said, I'm looking for someone to help me die. Do you think your church is up to it? Is that something you could do? The woman wanted a church that would not shy away from life's deepest questions. And All Saints Sunday is such a day. It is that festival in the church year when we look at the grim reaper right in the eye and remember those whom we've loved and lost. The first thing All Saints Day says to me, is, we didn't concoct this faith of ours. Here's a book I stumbled on by Thomas Lynch. He's an undertaker and a poet. One doesn't usually connect those two professions very often, but there's poetry in undertakers, and all undertakers are eventually taken under. When these two professions are combined in one work, it's remarkable. And in this thin little book, Lynch says, when death means nothing, life is meaningless. And we remember because we want to be remembered. When we do not take the dead seriously, we don't take living seriously. Lynch mentions a Victorian epitaph Behold me now as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. Not the sort of thing you'd put on Hallmark cards to send to your friends. And Lynch had an irreverent uncle who wrote a reply, to follow you, I won't consent until I know which way you went. <laughs> Over the years, we've lost some of our most loyal members especially this year. I think of Bob Labar and Bob Gilmore and Shirley Teshner and Jim Cork and Bill Engelhart, Jane Greeby, Mark Dauber, David Svon, Florence Handy, and only last week, Polly Brahm. People who were here every week for decades. And if I went further back, I'd have more names as faces rush to mind. And each one of these dear souls was here week after week. And also during the week, three of them were in the choir. And I'm not exaggerating when I say, I can see them with the red cassock and the white kata walking down this aisle week after week. I think of a preacher who attended Yale Divinity School and during his first day as a student, a dean told the incoming students to make friends with their classmates. And then he pointed to the library, the dean did, and he said, you have a few thousand people over there who have lived with God a lot longer than you have. Make friends with all those saints who now live in the library and want to take up residence in your soul and they can show you the way. The Southern writer, William Faulkner, was so right when he said, the past is not dead, it's not even past. And today I think of coaches and teachers and teammates and friends, more and more every year, who are part of the company of heaven and continue to cheer me on. I think of a woman who said to me once, I'm closer to my grandmother now that, than when she was alive. I, I think I know what she means. She now has a, an acute awareness of her grandmother's wisdom that maybe she didn't have years ago. Edith Wharton, who wrote that Pulitzer Prize winning Age of Innocence, at the very beginning on a dedication page of that autobiography, she writes, to my friends who on every All Souls night come and sit with me by the fire. Those whom we've loved and lost, they're still so real to us. 
I read in Down East, the magazine of Maine, an essay written by a man who was raking leaves this time of the year. He said he does it out of duty, but for his dad, it was a delight that took weeks. At the end of the essay, Marcel is thinking about his dad who died a few years ago, and he says, I rake, and as the breeze gently rustles the leaves, I listen for my dad's blessing. What I'm suggesting on this All Saints Day is this day is about the dead, not just the living. It's for them and to them that we look for meaning in life. This is why the music and the prayers and the liturgy of All Saints Day is what it is. It's not meant to tickle our fancy or give us an emotional kick or a momentary thrill. It's made, meant to take us to the depths. It's meant to teach us how to live and how to die. You will recall Archbishop Oscar Romero. He was murdered by the government while celebrating mass in El Salvador. At the altar celebrating mass, they shot him. And it was his practice during mass to read the names of those members of the community who had disappeared during the previous week, tortured, murdered. And during the prayers, the names of those murdered would be spoken one after another. And the congregation would respond to each name by boldly proclaiming presente, present. Now, we didn't concoct this faith on our own. The second thing on All Saints Day that I want to remind you of is that we're all homesick for heaven. No matter how healthy and how successful we've been, there is a deep need, deep within us, an emptiness that only God can fill. We have within us what the poet Blake called arrows of desire. We have these longings. We can try to explain them psychologically. We can try to explain everything psychologically. We can even try to explain psychologists psychologically. But that doesn't mean that there's no reality to which our hunger points. Oh, Henry wrote what, 600 short stories? They tell us that before he died, his last words were, turn on the lights, I don't wanna go home in the dark. When we are moved, by the sound of a trumpet or the depth of a cello or the haunting beauty of a great hymn, or we are moved to tears by some haunting sound or taste or smell. We can call such moments chemistry, but I prefer to call them epiphanies, reminding us that we're more than dust and ashes, that we belong to another world. We're more than reeds blowing in the wind, more than crops of wheat to be plowed plowed back into the earth. Rather, we are loved by God unconditionally, not just here, but eternally. Our souls are homesick for heaven. And that brings me to a big word today, and that word is hope. Yes, it's important to remember. And to some degree, that's the easy part. But All Saints Day is not just about remembering, it's also about anticipating. Remembrance and anticipation belong together. And that's what a sacrament is all about. We've been watching baseball, most of us have, I guess, these last few weeks. And it reminded me of an interesting article I clipped out of the Wall Street Journal. The reporter tells of meeting her neighbor in an elevator back in 1986. This neighbor, well into her 80s, seldom had much to say, but this time she wanted to talk. My dear, she announced without preamble, I watched the game last night when I was lying in bed until the ninth inning and I saw the Mets were one out from losing in a hopeless situation, and I figured there was no need to watch any further. I decided to go to sleep. I rolled over, turned my face to the wall, and then I thought of my dear husband and what he used to say. He was a businessman and a good one, and I remember what he told me. He said, as long as there's even a chance, even a small chance, there's always hope. That was his philosophy all through life, the way he was in business. So I turned back to the game. 
Many of you will remember what happened in 1986. The Mets won the National League Championship, 16-inning game in Houston, and the Mets were just one out from losing the World Series to the Red Sox. Ninth inning, the woman had turned off her set and gone to bed, and then she remembered her husband's words, there's always hope. And just as she turned on her set, Mookie Wilson's grounder went through the legs of the unfortunate Bill Buckner, and the Mets won. I watched it five times early this morning. Buckner had a bad foot, so even if he caught the ball, M Mookie Wilson would have probably made it anyway. And they, he had to move to Idaho to get away from those Boston fans. It even brought tears to the eyes of one of our best known historians, Doris Kearns Goodwin. She spoke at our little library in Maine a few years ago and I spent too much time at the beach where I could have met her and talked with her. But in her little book, Wait Till Next Year, this is what she writes. As I sat in front of the TV in tears, my two boys rushed to console me. Don't worry, mom, they'll be next year. I did not want to remind them the Red Sox had not won in 75 years. <laughs> there would be time enough for them to learn a harsher truth. The great historian goes on. But as they continued their assurances, I realized they were right. They were right. There would be another season. There would be another chance. Remembrance and anticipation. This is the hope of All Saints Day. Another season, another chance. In our second lesson, John writes, beloved, we're God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be. And so it is with us. Here we are in November. The day is shortening, dark at five this afternoon. The darkness deepening. A long winter's death ahead as we shuffle and slosh our way over a carpet of rotting leaves. Mortality is all about us, and no amount of clock changing can change that fact that there's nothing in nature to speak of new life and the flowering and the hope. But on All Saints Day, we can sing our alleluias and sound our trumpets because the end of it all is not a withering away into death. Life is determinable, no. The end of it all is God's triumphant yes.
this All Saints Sunday, we remember with thanksgiving those members and friends of our congregation who have entered the church triumphant during the past year. Joyce, Bianca, David Boyer, Bonnie Graham, Robert Gilmore, Ruth Kistler, Gregory Ross, Mary Presty, Elizabeth Taylor, Charles Mayer, Mark Dauber, James Serator, Jane Greeby, Barry Hawk, Tommy Sullivan, Danielle Gracie, Kent Schultz, Bill Islinger, Jean Klusner, Ken Thompson, Dominic Testani, John McGrath, Gloria Giordano, Dominic Tassari, Raymond Fretz, June Schultz, Dora Barnes, Richard Vitucci, David Weckheser, Roxy McCullough, Dwayne Presti, Russell Shemp, Sally Robinson, Elizabeth Miller, Eileen Van Paris, David Svon, Lynn Zimmerman, William Dietz, Lillian Weckheser, Lynn Hennessy, Joan Roth, Florence Handy, Karen Weiner, Dirk Dayton, Fred Kistler, Lorraine Franchi, Paul Maynard, Martha Groman, Deborah Brick, William Anderson, Joyce Cutney, Doris Cox, and more recently, Emily Weiser, Ryan Tomaselli, and Polly Brom. Beginning in silence, let us pray. Eternal God, make this day a day to remember the unseen cloud of witnesses who compass us about, those who in every age and generation witness to their faith in life and in death, those who served others at the cost of pain, persecution, and death, those for whom all the trumpets sounded as they passed over to the other side, those whom we've loved and who have gone to be with you and whose names are written on our hearts. Help us to walk worthily of those in whose unseen presence life is lived. Help us to have in our lives their courage in danger, their steadfastness in trial, their perseverance in difficulty, their loyalty when loyalty is costly, their love which nothing can change, their joy which nothing can take away. So grant to us in your good time to share with them the blessedness of your nearer presence that we may also come to that life when all the questions are answered, when the tears are wiped away, when we will meet again, never to be separated from them, those whom we have loved and lost a while, when we shall be forever with our Lord. So grant to us in this life never to forget those who have gone before so that in the life to come we may share their blessedness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>